This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As hurricane season begins, we turn to Puerto Rico, which was devastated in 2017 when Hurricane Maria killed at least 3,000 people, destroyed much of the island's power grid, leaving many without electricity for months. A new investigation reveals the Puerto Rican government issued a $1.5 billion contract to a company for the first large power generation project since the storm without the proper oversight. The report accuses Puerto Rico's Electric Power Authority of giving an unfair advantage to New Fortress Energy when it contracted with the company to convert two major power stations from operating on diesel to natural gas. The report also accuses the island's power company of failing to consider the project's environment, safety and health impacts and alternative sources of power, like renewable energy. The report comes amidst ongoing moves to privatize Puerto Rico's electric grid. It was co-authored by Ingrid Villabiaggi, who joins us now from San Juan, Puerto Rico. She is president of Cambio, a Puerto Rico-based environmental nonprofit, former chief of staff for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. She co-authored the new report with the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Ingrid, welcome to Democracy Now! Just lay out what you found and the level of, really, uh, vision corruption in this. Um, yes. First of all, thank you for having me. And uh, like you just mentioned, this is an ill-conceived project uh, full of fiscally irresponsible practices, um, full of irregularities that start from uh, the absence of a desirability and convenience study uh, that did not even uh, was put forth in order to determine whether this was a project that was beneficial to Puerto Rico. Um, this is the conversion to natural gas of two units uh, for the San Juan 5 and 6 uh, generation facility uh, for the Power Authority PREPA in Puerto Rico. Um, this is a project that was uh, started as an unsolicited proposal by New Fortress Energy, uh, which it presented uh, December 2017, uh, scarcely two months after Hurricane Maria, when Puerto Ricans did not have uh, power, we didn't even have adequate communication, and we already had this company uh, presenting to the Power Authority this unsolicited proposal, which provided them with access and continued communication uh, to the authority and a confidentiality agreement, uh, which granted them information about these two units. Then the authority moves into an RFP process without uh, providing information to bidders of this ongoing communication with this uh, company or the confidentiality agreement that it had set forth, as well as other information um, that was vital in terms of the uh, properties that it had strategically acquired. Um, so we're calling for the cancellation of this project, which, as you mentioned, is a 1.5 billion dollar project that would continue to lock in fossil fuels on the island and would prevent the aggressive integration of renewable energy, which would be the sustainable transformation that Puerto Rico deserves right now. And Ingrid Villabiaggi, how did New Fortress Energy get this sort of cozy relationship with the Puerto Rican? Uh, the uh, the Electric Power Authority. It's it's a company, as I understand it, that was formed by former executives of BlackRock, of uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, and of UBS. Uh, what what's been its track record? Does it have a track record uh, in this kind well, of um, of uh, uh, liquid gas production for electricity any anywhere else in the world? It has. Uh, first of all, it doesn't have a track record in Puerto Rico. Um, and it has a very limited uh, time experience in terms of uh, natural gas. Um, that's one of the questions that we raise. How was this company selected uh, versus other companies? And like I mentioned, this was presented as an unsolicited proposal to the authority. So uh, the, the project as itself was conceived by the private sector, which has been uh, one of the great problems that uh, PREPA has faced in the past in terms of lacking planning and then allowing for then private interest to push in these projects that do not serve the best interests of the people of Puerto Rico. Our investigation is based on public documentation that we were able to obtain through litigation with PREPA. Uh, PREPA was not uh, willing to provide us this document and we had to go to court to get them. Uh, so, uh, what we found through that uh, public documentation is all these irregularities 
um, in the process prior to the RFP process and during the RFP process. Uh, we are able to identify, though, um, some law firms, for example, that uh, were contracted by PREPA to negotiate this contract after it was awarded to New Fortress. And that same U.S. law firm represents entities for the parent company of New Fortress. Um, we were not able to find a, a specific documentation uh, regarding how they, uh, who introduced them to Puerto Rico. And that's, I think, part of the investigation that be, should be conducted uh, by federal and local authorities uh, to find out uh, and, and provide questions to the, many que to the many issues that we raise in the report. And uh, Ingrid, I'd like to ask you also about a separate report that came out uh, that uh, that uh, Chris Christie, the former uh, former governor of New Jersey, and also a uh, 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 on the original transition team for for uh, President Trump, uh, is is now a lobbyist uh, at thirty thousand dollars a month for the Puerto Rico Electric Company. What exactly is Chris Christie doing there, and what's his expertise? Well Yes, um, there's there's no information in terms of what he's doing. Uh, PREPA announced last week, or it was disclosed, that this contract was uh, uh, was uh, set forth for the upcoming months, supposedly uh, to to help with federal funding and uh, to get federal funding to actually uh, arrive to Puerto Rico. However, this is another of those contracts that has no accountability. Um, and sums to the and, and comes to add to over 270 million dollars in contracts that have been awarded uh, at Prepa for professional services and financial advisory in the past two three years. We have to remember 270 million dollars. Perhaps doesn't sound like a big amount of money uh, in the U.S., but this is a bankrupt corporation. 270 million dollars in public services, uh, public professional services, um, uh, amounts to a whole lot of money that could be used. Uh, for the maintenance of the infrastructure, for adopting renewables, for rooftop solar projects. Um, so uh, we definitely question this uh, professional service contract as well as the other ones that have been uh, awarded in the authority. So finally, as uh, you are in uh, hurricane season, uh, Ingrid, uh, began on June 1st, and you have this sun-soaked island to have poured this much money, let alone the, um, uh, the reason that they have given it to this company. Um, Jose Ortiz, the head of the power company, um, said that um, your report showed complete ignorance around the contract, that it was approved by the Federal Control Board that oversees Puerto Rico's finances. If you could respond and say what you're demanding right now. Well, I mean, Jose Ortiz's reaction uh, does not address any of the irregularities that we've raised in the report, and he tries to dismiss uh, our report by questioning uh, the professional experience of the authors, in this case, Thompson Sencillo and myself. Uh, we're both former public officials with vast experience in contract supervision. Um, and like I mentioned, he's just trying to distract the attention from the report. Um, and in terms of your, uh, uh, your statement regarding uh, the beginning of uh, hurricane season, definitely. Um, it is quite, it creates quite a, a bit of anxiety uh, to know that the forecast for this hurricane season is going to be quite an active one um, and that Puerto Rico is not uh, better poised to address uh, an extreme weather event than it was uh, when we faced Hurricane Maria, precisely because uh, PREPA has not uh, implemented and has not addressed renewable energy and other more sustainable alternatives to make the grid more resilient and reduce vulnerabilities uh, for the population of Puerto Rico. Regarding uh, approvals during the process, those are some of the things that we question in the report. I mean, the Fiscal Control Board approved this, yet acknowledging in their own write-up that uh, the project was 30 to 40 percent above uh, industry benchmark costs. So, I mean, uh, we, we do want, that's why we're asking for an independent outside investigation of this whole process to see how uh, a process with how a project with and a contractor with so many uh, issues and, and a process with so many irregularities was able to conclude and a contract was able to be signed 
Um, and, and now we have this project that we have to deal with on the island. Well, Ingrid Villa Viaggi, we thank you so much for being with us, president of Cambio, speaking to us from San Juan, Puerto Rico. And before we go to break in the next, oh, 30 seconds, Juan, if you could talk about um, the Supreme Court decision that just came down around Puerto Rico's debt. Uh, yes, Amy. Well, a couple of weeks ago, the Supreme Court ruled, uh, but it was in the midst of all of the uh, the protests, the national protests around police abuse, so it didn't get much attention in the U.S. Uh, it basically ruled that the appointment of the Promesa Board, which basically is running Puerto Rico's economy and and uh, uh, and is really supersedes the local government, that the appointment of those officials by Congress and the president was uh, was legal. Uh, there had been there had been a series of lawsuits uh, in the courts trying to challenge the legality under the appointments clause of the Constitution that the the members of the board were not uh, appointed with the advice and consent of the Senate as is required of federal officers. And the court ruled it was a strange opinion. It was a unanimous opinion. But there was a seven-vote majority uh, opinion of uh, uh, written by uh, Justice Breyer. And then there were two other concurring opinions, but separate opinions, one by Justice Thomas and one by Justice Sotomayor. And Justice Sotomayor's opinion was actually a dissent, <laughs> uh, even though she agreed uh, uh, with the majority opinion. She went into perhaps her most uh, detailed uh, a legal brief on the status of Puerto Rico. Uh, and the important thing, I think, that Justice Sotomayor said in this decision, uh, in, in her opinion, uh, was that uh, uh, that really she questioned the entire legitimacy of the PROMESA board itself. And she said, and I want to quote this, because uh, people should read this opinion. It's, it was a 24-page opinion. It says, these cases raise serious questions about when, if ever, the federal government may constitutionally exercise authority to establish territorial officers in a territory like Puerto Rico, where Congress seemingly ceded that authority long ago to Puerto Rico itself. And she, she went on to say that the PROMESA board members tasked with determining the financial fate of a self-governing territory exist in a twilight zone of accountability, neither selected by Puerto Rico itself nor subject to the strictures of the appointments clause. And she goes on to say, I am skeptical that the Constitution countenances this freewheeling exercise of control over a population that the federal government has explicitly agreed to recognize as operating under a government of their own choosing. Uh, she basically uh, says, you are not taking into effect, uh, into account the rest of the court that back in the 1950s, the United States granted self-governance to Puerto Rico, and now by the imposition of the control board, that's taken that away. And so she basically says, I'm going along with this appointments clause decision, but the basic question here has not been settled. Uh, and I, I think it's the most uh, she's had several opinions now, dissenting opinions to the court on the issue of Puerto Rico, Sanchez Valle, Franklin Templeton, and now this one, where she basically says, you got to deal with the colonial relationship of Puerto Rico. Well, and of course, we'll continue to look at that. But up next, we're going to look at an insurgent campaign to unseat 16-term Congress member and House Foreign Affairs Committee Chair Elliot Engel. We're going to speak with uh, his challenger, Jamal Bowman, who's just been endorsed by The New York Times, AOC, uh, Senators Warren and Bernie Sanders. Stay with us.